Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Hey brother! Ben, do you think a muggle could ever become master of the Elder Wand? Yes, I know, we've discussed the Elder Wand to death. Like who and when and why certain people became masters of it whenever they did and the weird rules associated with it. And to be honest, still, I'm not even sure I agree with what Harry tells Voldemort about how he personally came to be master of it. Which as a refresher is that Draco disarmed Dumbledore, which then made Draco the master, and then later at Malfoy Manor, Harry physically takes Draco's wand from him which makes Harry the master, even though it's a completely different one. Which, like, it's fine, but also, Harry walks into the woods using the invisibility cloak, which he's already the master of, and then activates the resurrection stone to summon his dead loved ones to help him accept sacrificing himself for everyone back at the school, so he's also the master of the resurrection stone, and like, I don't know, uniting the Deathly Hallows, they're not all three on the same person at the same time, but they're all real close. I mean, whoever unites the Deathly Hallows becomes master of death, and promptly after dying, he doesn't die, which seems like he's already master of death. I mean, I guess even if the Draco version is true, then he's already master of the Elder Wand at that point, so either way, whatever, it's Draco's one, okay. But alternate endings aside, the point is the rules are kind of weird, which makes for interesting questions when you thrust odd circumstances into them. Like, for example, what would happen if, say, a muggle disarmed someone who was the master of the Elder Wand? Well, today we discuss. Guys, before we dive on into today's video, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Audible. This is a service that personally, I literally use every single day, whether it's driving to work or doing the dishes or mowing the lawn or just even falling asleep. Actually on the falling asleep one, one of my favorite features is the sleep timer, which you can just set for like 10 or 15 minutes so that if you fall asleep, the book doesn't just keep running all night and you totally lose your spot. But Audible is great because they have a huge selection of audiobooks as well as other spoken word media available in their vast library. Literally thousands of titles to choose from. Actually, fun fact, if you listen to literally everything in the Audible library, it would take you, wait for it, three centuries. Unless that is you boost the narration speed, which this is something Ben does. He listens to everything at two times speed, so it's only gonna take him like 150 years. He's very proud of his listening speed. He hears way faster than you do. And finally, Audible offers a monthly credit which you can redeem for literally anything in their entire libraries, whether it be a brand new bestseller or an old childhood favorite. You can keep your credits for up to a year and if you get something and you don't like it, great news, you can just swap it out. And this month, the book I want to recommend to you guys is called The Rise of Kiyoshi. You might not have realized this, but the world of Avatar The Last Airbender has expanded into novels, which you can now listen to with with your ears at regular speed or bend speed. And The Rise of Kyoshi is the story of the Avatar two avatars before Aang. She shows up a lot in the show and it's really cool to get her backstory. If you'd like to sign up for a free trial of Audible's Premium Plus account, you can head over to audible.com slash supercarlin or text supercarlin to 500, 500 Again, that is a free trial of Audible's Premium Plus account at audible.com slash supercarlin or text supercarlin to 500-500. Link is in the description down below. I am fascinated by this question because there are just actually a lot more layers at work than you might be aware of. First, let's just talk wand lore. Like even Ollivander himself says, wizards don't know everything about how wands work in that very vague way people use to answer questions when they don't know the entire answer. The wand chooses the wizard. That much has always been clear to those of us who have studied wand lore. A person can still use a wand that hasn't chosen them though. Oh yes, if you are any wizard at all, you will be able to channel your magic through almost any instrument. The best results, however, must always come where there is the strongest affinity between wizard and wand. These connections are complex, an initial attraction, and then a mutual quest for experience. The wand learning from the wizard, the wizard from the wand. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that explanation is really open-ended at the end of the day, which gives us a lot to work with. For example, he states you could channel your magic through almost anything, which is just so funny to think about. Like I'm imagining a wizard just like picking up an umbrella and waving it around like, <laughs> wait. The point though is that wands are merely vessels through which your magic 
magic flows. They are not responsible for the magic itself. Though to be fair, they are the most effective instruments for producing magic. In fact, if you go digging through the Wizarding World archives, you can find writing about how certain cultures in history didn't use wands at all, like indigenous Americans just used wandless magic. This is also a part of the explanation for why child wizards are able to make random things happen when they're angry or scared, even though they don't have a wand. Wands are only amplifiers of magic, not the source of the magic itself. I mean, if wands could just do magic, then there would be no squibs, right? Can't do magic? Just get a wand and voila, problem solved. But no, a wand will never help Filch do magic because he can't do magic because he has no magic. Although something is up with that cat. I am just saying, like, I'm pretty positive Filch is a poltergeist, but that's a whole different as ever in Harry Potter though, there are some weird situations that need explaining, like when Harry's wand produces golden fire at the Battle of Seven Potters. Wands can't do magic on their own, and yet Harry is convinced his wand acts of its own accord and shoots very powerful golden fire at Voldemort. And the first thing worth noting here is that this is a very atypical situation for a wand to begin with, and that Harry's wand is not exactly brand new at this point. Like, it has had a lot of its own experiences through the Wizarding World with Harry. If it was brand new off the shelf, you can bet this would not have happened. But as Dumbledore explains in King's Cross, Harry's wand is able to perform this way because it absorbed some of Voldemort's power when Harry dueled him in the graveyard. And so when specifically Harry is holding the wand and is pointing it specifically at Voldemort, it is indeed extra powerful. It has essentially been upgraded by experience, but is only extra sentient in this way for Harry. So like, again, Harry couldn't just hand his wand to a squib or a muggle and point them at Voldemort and reproduce the same results. But so then what does happen if you hand a muggle a wand? Well, based on what we've learned so far, you'd think absolutely nothing. The wand is nothing more than a fancy stick to them. Not that that stopped us from buying any, mind you. I mean, who doesn't love a good fancy stick? Oh God, oh God. Got 99 problems and they're all fancy sticks. Anyway, I too would have argued that muggle plus wand equals muggle with stick, but I would have been wrong. In fact, diving back into the Wizarding World archives, you can find out exactly what happens when a muggle picks up a wand when James Stewart, one of the founders of Ilvermorny, picks one up. As a salt watch, James finished marking the graves he had dug by hand, then picked up the two broken wands that had lain beside the boot parents. Frowning, he examined the sparking core of the dragon heart string that protruded from Mr. Boots, then gave it a casual wave. As invariably happens when a nomad waves a wand, it rebelled. James was sent flying backwards across the clearing, hit a tree, and was knocked out cold. Now, to be fair, the wand in question was broken, and we know that even for a fully trained wizard, well, sort of fully trained wizard, using a broken wand, the results aren't great. But even if the wand James had picked up had been whole, I think the results would have been the same as the author has also weighed in on what happens when muggles handle wands. Now, I've been asked what would happen if a muggle picked up a magic wand in my world and the answer would probably be something accidental, possibly quite violent because a wand in my world is merely a vehicle, a vessel for what lies inside the person. This actually also lines up with what happens to that monkey who takes Newt's wand in Fantastic Beasts. <laughs> I mean, I guess to be fair, we can't know for sure that that monkey wasn't magical, but I'm gonna go ahead and make that leap. To me, it would honestly make more sense if nothing happened, but obviously I'm wrong in this situation and something does happen. But the result is still completely accidental and has nothing to do with the wielder actually doing magic. But whether or not something would happen or if a muggle could do magic with the Elder Wand is not our main question today. Our question is just, could a muggle be the master of the Elder Wand. The Elder Wand is supposed to be the most sentient wand, and we know the saying, the wand chooses the wizard. So the obvious answer would be no. But for wand, the wand chooses the wizard is just a saying and not necessarily any sort of hard truth. And for two, let's review again the canon version of how Harry becomes master of the Elder Wand by physically taking a completely separate wand from Draco, who is apparently currently the master. That transfers mastery of Draco's wand and any other wand he was master of to Harry. The Elder Wand from miles away recognizes that its master 
loses a wand. But what is really important to me about it is that Draco loses his wand in a completely non-magical way. Harry just wrenches it out of his hand, something any muggle also could have done. And you might think, yeah, but like a muggle could never disarm a wizard who has a wand, and yet that's just not true. I mean, even Dudley manages to punch Harry in the face at the beginning of Order of the Phoenix. <laughs> So let's say, for example, Dudley meets Draco on the street. He sees his wand, recognizes what it is, totally freaks out, punches him in the face, takes the wand and runs. Like, to me, I don't see how that would be any different from how Harry took the wand from Draco, except that Draco also got punched. Which, as far as I'm concerned, would have been a great redemption arc for Dudley and put that boxing background to some serious use. <laughs> Either way, Draco loses the wand. Like, yes, if Harry had done something magical to disarm Draco, then sure, the Elder Wand would have a way of detecting that Harry was magical. But he doesn't do anything magical. It's completely physical, and yet Harry becomes the master. So if Dudley took it, why would it be any different? Are we supposed to think the Elder Wand can determine the magicalness of someone's punch or the wrenching from someone's hands? I mean, I don't know, maybe it could, but either way, the end result is the same. Draco is disarmed and defeated, so I don't see why the end result for the Elder Wand wouldn't also be the same. Which is to say, in that scenario, Dudley Dursley would be the master of the Elder Wand, a sentence I didn't think was possible to exist. Now, to be fair, that wouldn't really mean very much for Dudley, other than that, he's about to probably become the target of some very high-powered wizards. But even if Dudley was the master of the Elder Wand, it wouldn't mean he was any steps closer to actually doing magic with a wand, even the world's most powerful wand. At best, I would say he would at least be able to pick it up and wave it around just consequence-free because he was the master, but it would still pretty much just behave like a regular stick. And again, nothing wrong with regular sticks. They just keep going. Keep thinking this joke is funny and don't have to pick them up. That's best case scenario though. It's also possible that the moment Dudley picked it up, the Elder Wand would be like, whoa, you are a muggle and I am not okay with it. See ya. But assuming Dudley did become the master of the Elder Wand, even if he never picked it up, I do think it would mean that another wizard could come along and defeat Dudley and become the master themselves, having defeated the previous master. And that is the explanation that makes the most sense to me. Yes, a muggle could become master of the Elder Wand. No, they would not be able to do any magic. Yes, they would probably just become a terrible target and die soon anyway, so it's not desirable. But Ben, my question for you and everyone else is, do you agree, could a muggle become master of the Elder Wand? And bonus question, what's your favorite wand? Personally, I really love the Weasley Twins ones because when you line them up like this, you have the start of a broom handle and the back of a broom. And I just think that's so clever. But guys, thanks so much as always for watching today's video. Don't forget to leave a like on it if you haven't already and subscribe by clicking that little button right down there so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you would like a more in-depth explanation about how Harry is able to produce those golds and flames, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, until next time, I will see you in another life, brother.